them. They're awesome. Awesome, awesome. All right. Well, I wanted to quickly just say uh, thank you to Pastor John for his illustrated message last week and the hair. I I, I saw online, I'm like, And it was perfect because I mean, he's standing there and he's, he's got his hand in his pocket. And I'm like, the dude looks like he's like late 20s and early 30s, man. I'm like, are you kidding me? If you did not see that, you guys have got to go online and see this. It's just, I mean, then it freaked you. Like they got Donnie. It was so funny because they told Donnie when he comes in because he's on the safety team. And he goes, you know what? They told him, he goes, there's this dude sitting up on the front row. And Pastor John's seat, we're not sure what's going on with him, but you'll see him. He's got his hair, and you need to keep an eye on him. <laughs> so Donnie walks in, he's like, Who's this guy? What is going on? Why is he up there sitting there? And he finally looks over. <laughs> that was so funny. But thank you, Pastor John, for the illustrated message. Thank you. Great job. Great job. All right, well, this morning, uh, a couple things uh, we want to jump into today. You can grab your handout uh, this morning. I'm going to speak on a subject that really, honestly, I've never solely focused on before. Of course, we reference it a lot, and I realize that it is a very significant part of the gospel message. We've read scriptures on it, but I've never really dedicated a series of messages on this topic alone, and that is the subject of the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, there are a number of reasons for this. One of those reasons is that the Bible tells us, and the Bible communicates that the blood of Jesus is a mystery. It is very mysterious. It's one of those parts of the Christian doctrine in the Bible that is mysterious, and in its nature, And once you open the door, it goes off in so many different directions that it it becomes a very unique topic. And another reason um, why I haven't really uh, addressed this is because I feel very inadequate, for one thing, um, to talk about this because of the nature of the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, as I was studying this, you would not believe the number of doctrinal positions on the blood of Christ that are out there. Some are bizarre. Some are really unique and strange. Some, you go, okay, I get it. Other ones, you're going, I'm not following you there. Um, So there's so many different things, and honestly, I just felt very inadequate, unqualified uh, to speak about it um, with any kind of real authority. Another reason... I've never really focused on this subject is, quite honestly, the whole blood thing grosses me out. Um, Just to be honest, forgive me, Lord, but, you know, growing up on a farm with all kinds of uh, animals, I've seen my share of blood growing up for a number of different reasons, and I associated it not with something very positive. But now we look at this and we think about it because blood... In its nature, blood is messy. It's just messy. And so when you begin to go through the Word of God and you begin to discover all of the Scripture that talks about the blood of Jesus, it becomes kind of messy in a, in a sense. But we're going to find out as we go through this, there's a purpose. God had an amazing purpose for the blood of Jesus. So regardless of those reasons, I felt that it was such an important topic for us, for our faith, that I needed to address it because it is an area, it is an area that you and I have extreme power over the darkness and over the devil. One thing I know is that the devil hates the blood of Jesus. The devil hates the blood of Jesus. He doesn't like us talking about it. He doesn't like us reading about it. And God forbid that we would actually do something in our life because of it. So he hates it and doesn't like me talking about it. So in my holy rebelness of myself, I'm willing to lay aside all of my puny human weaknesses and see if we can flush the devil out of the darkness 
And we can get the devil, his demons, and all of darkness running for their life, scared and plugging their ears. Which is, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a good visual, visual and video I would love to see. Because the devil hates the blood of Jesus. So the more, most important key and really the essential element that I felt the Holy Spirit wanted you and I to see, and this is the title of this morning's message, and it is this fact, and the fact is, is that your life is in His blood. Your life is in His blood. When I was growing up, we used to sing a particular hymn along with a number of different hymns that communicated this unique mystery about the blood of Christ, but this one really did affect me. This one I've never forgotten. It's always been one of those that stuck in my mind. It was a song that was written in 1876 by a Baptist minister by the name of Robert Lowry, and the song is titled, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. How many of you are familiar some of you that have never heard it, I encourage you go and listen to this song. It's a hymn that was, it was sung many times in traditional churches in that time. And it begins with a series of questions. And I'm sure <clears throat> as I read this to you, you will hear the tune. Some of us who are familiar with it will hear this tune in our minds. And the question begins, he says, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, I remember <clears throat> the strange feeling inside that I used to get when we sang this song, it was kind of disturbing and scary to me and at the same time made me feel good in a strange way inside. That is kind of the nature and the mystery <clears throat> of the blood of Jesus. I thought it was strange as a kid that we're singing a song about blood, right? You know, in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking weird things. Growing up on the farm, was seeing blood at different times in my life, and I'm thinking, why are we doing this? You know, as a little kid, it's a little strange to be dealing with that. I think most of us never consider <clears throat> blood to be beautiful. The sight of it doesn't generally invoke a feeling of comfort or peace. Most people associate blood with feelings of fear or something has gone seriously wrong. At least that's the way I've considered it in the past. The Apostle Peter, in speaking about the blood of Jesus in his letter to the churches, to the early churches, encourages us to consider, <clears throat> when we're thinking about the blood of Jesus, he encourages us to think of it this way. In verse 18 he says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. If I may, just for a minute before getting into the details and the application for us today, I'd like to point out something significant that Peter calls the blood of Jesus Christ precious. The blood of Jesus is precious. When I looked up this word precious, <clears throat> in other translations, I found something truly amazing and astounding. Out of 49 translations, and some of those translations that date back to over 500 years, every single one translated this word from the Greek into the English word precious. 
Every single translation said the blood of Jesus is precious. See, I didn't consider that an accident. I believe the Holy Spirit wanted to protect this word because of who and what it is attached to. The blood is precious beyond any human understanding. This is the blood of Jesus. And there's something very, very significant and important for us in this matter of the precious blood for us to consider. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 10, I encourage you to read Hebrews chapter 10. We'll talk some more about that next week, but Hebrews is an incredible book, so if you read Hebrews chapter 10, you might as well read Hebrews 9 and 11, and then just go to the beginning and read the whole thing if you can. <clears throat> Puts it all in there quite good. But Hebrews chapter 10, um, I want to point out to you a very important verse in here to think about. And one of the reasons that, that honestly I've been reluctant to preach on this or teach on it. And it says this in Hebrews 10.29. It says, how much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace. Peter says that it's precious blood. The writer of Hebrews says anyone who tramples or regards the blood of Jesus as unclean or in a disrespectful manner deserves severe punishment. Other translations use the word instead of disrespectful, they use the word common thing. Treating the blood of Jesus as just common, like everybody else's blood. So what you have is a serious warning to those who refuse to acknowledge with Peter that the blood of Christ was precious. Let me just say this, just so you know, we as leadership here at Southgate would never treat the blood of Jesus as unclean or common. We would never trample underfoot the Son of God or the work of His grace and mercy because of the blood of Jesus. We with Peter affirm that the blood of Jesus is precious. The shedding of that blood and the death was the price for our sins paid by Jesus Christ. We have Easter that's soon coming upon us in a time that we understand this will bring a bigger picture to why we celebrate the way we celebrate in what Jesus Christ did, the shedding of that blood and death was the price that He paid. And He literally poured out His blood in a sacrificial offering of His life. And in so doing, because of that, He sealed forever the new covenant and purchased our redemption by paying the price for our sin. The blood of Jesus is one of the most important themes in the New Testament. The blood of Christ as a term or phrase is mentioned 30 times in the New Testament. It is mentioned nearly three times as often as the cross of Christ and five times as often as the death of Christ. So the word blood is the chief term in the, in the New Testament to refer to the atoning work of Christ. And when the writer of Hebrews says that anyone regards it as unclean, the blood of the covenant is worthy of severe punishment. He means to say someone who treats with disrespect the atoning work of Christ. Not just the blood as an entity or a physical thing, but the atoning work of Christ, the very person of Jesus Christ Himself. So when we mistreat or we treat as the blood something less than Jesus, we deserve severe punishment. God is not talking, the Word of God is not talking about the fluid. In the natural, He's talking about the work of what Jesus Christ did in reference to His blood. We see this picture in all through the Old Testament as the blood that was shed by animals. They were slaughtered and killed to cover the sin. It was a foreshadow of things to come. And that person is the person of Jesus Christ. So He shed His blood for us and as us. And because of that, our life is in His blood. So let's look together what the Bible, why the Bible says this is so important. 
and why the blood of Jesus is so precious and valuable. Number one, blood is life. Number one, blood is life. Every living thing needs blood for life. You need blood to live. Human beings have 1.5 to 1.1.2 1.2 to 1.5 gallons of this red stuff in their bodies. And if you lose too much of this stuff, things don't go well. America's first president died because of a medical practice known as bloodletting. Where they drain blood out of you in order to remove a sickness or fever. So they felt... Let blood out, the fever goes out. Sickness goes out. The more blood you let out, the less the sickness you'll have in your body. Well, that didn't work so well because on December 14, 1779, George Washington died as a result of the loss of too much blood. Thank God that medical science has advanced past that day. How many of you have ever experienced the loss of a substantial amount of blood in your life? Has anybody that ever happened to you? Well, you know that you only have so much of that stuff in you. And you've got to have it. Sometimes when you lose too much blood, what do they do? They give you a transfusion. Because your life is in your blood. Your natural life is in your blood. In our modern world today, they can find all kinds of things out about you and your health by looking at your blood. Blood is important for life. No other natural ingredient or man-made material can relate, replace blood as the means of sustaining life. Only God can create blood. As advanced as the medical science world is, they can't create blood. They have to get blood. They do blood drives so that they can have blood stored for people that need blood. And it's interesting, blood, you can't just mix everybody's blood. Some person's blood may not work for me or vice versa. You have to have a specific type blood that works for you. It's interesting that Jesus Christ shed blood on the cross worked for everyone. Not just a few. Jesus did it for us. Your life, look at your neighbor and say, my life is in the blood. Leviticus 17, 4 says, for the life of every creature is its blood. Its blood is its life. Therefore I have said to the people of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any creature. For those of you that like sushi, I'm kidding. I'm just, no, I'm not. No, I, I'm, I, I go there. I'm a red meat guy. What can I tell you? Yeah, so my, my mom and dad need to read this scripture right here. They used to go out and they eat meat. Man, that thing is still making noise. And I'm like, Dad, there's something unscriptural about this. No, I, I really did it says, and whoever eats this shall be cut off. Isn't that interesting? So there's a lot if you read this and go into why God told them to do this. So, but the life is in the blood. We're alive because of our blood. The second reason why the blood of Jesus is precious and valuable and important is because the blood of Jesus has given us atonement. Given us atonement. This will be the last point that I make today, but we need to... Go with this for just a minute so you understand what this word means. This word atonement isn't a word we frequently use in our day-to-day -day conversations. According to the dictionary, it basically means the reparation for an offense or injury or the act of showing you that you are sorry for doing something wrong in the past. It has the same meaning as more, a more familiar word such as reparation, payment, restitution, to make amends, anybody make amends, we've heard that. In other words, it means if you break something, you fix it. So if you break it, you fix it. Atonement means it's your responsibility. It means bringing two things together. When you break it down, atonement is a combination of at one and meant. So at one meant, God's goal is... And the word atonement is to take two separate things that aren't in agreement to bring them into agreement on one particular area. So as often 
It was often used in the 1500s English language to mean being at one with others. Biblical atonement has kind of a little of both definitions. However, there is one key difference in how the Bible uses the word which we'll look at. But let's look at how this word is used so we can better understand why Jesus did this for us. So the word atonement, for those of you that are you know, more detailed and descriptive and want a little bit more than somebody else, here you go. The word atonement in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word kippur. Kippur appears only six times in the Old Testament. With his first appearance found in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 10, it says this, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns, that's the altar, once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement, he shall make atonement for it once in a year throughout your generations. It is the most, it is most holy to the, word, to the Lord. Interestingly, Kippur, that particular word, only appears once in this verse. The other atonements in the Hebrew are the Hebrew word kafar, the verb form of Kippur. Kafar means to cover over, purge, make reconciliation, or pacify. It appears over a hundred times in the Old Testament and is translated into different uh, various English words. So the concrete meaning of atonement in Hebrew is the covering or the removal of a transgression. It is when an offended person pardons or removes the offense. How many of you ever heard the word pardon? We have I pardon you or somebody gets pardoned. That means it's like that offense never occurred. So atoning means to create a situation where that offense has never occurred. You may recognize this Hebrew word in connection with a particular Jewish holiday called, did anybody know? Yom Kippur. In actuality, it means, guess what? The name Yom Kippur means the Day of Atonement. They observe it every year with acts of fasting, prayer, repentance. Some people even beat themselves in acts of penance for their sin. And we celebrate atonement also. But we don't do it with fasting and repentance and beating ourselves. But we do it with celebrations of thanksgiving and joy at Easter time. And why? Because our sins are atoned for by the blood of Jesus. Our sins are forgiven and removed from us, and we are at peace with God. So our day of atonement is not a day of repentance and prayer and sadness and fasting. Our day is a day of celebration because we have been forgiven. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to do penance. We come to Christ because of what He's done for us. We are forgiven. The blood of Jesus is the only cleansing agent for sin in the universe. There's no other way. There's no other way. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. You come to Christ, put your trust in Him, and that's how you receive forgiveness. Not just because Jesus said it. It's because He did it. See, Jesus didn't have the right to release forgiveness to you by His Word He could only receive and bring forgiveness to you by His action. And we're going to find out why in a moment. He had authority once He did what He did. The word atonement in the New Testament is the Greek word katalage, but you see how it's spelled. If you can figure it out, that would be great because I don't. Um, It occurs only once in Romans 5.11. And it says this, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So if you see this, it's important to understand that this word is not just thrown around all over the place. It's very specific, and God wants you to understand how precious this is. It is translated as reconciliation in the New King James and the English Standard Version, this word means reconciliation, restoration, or favor. And it's, this is what's important. It means it is when two parties come together in agreement on the same 
position. So from both the Hebrew and the Greek definitions, biblical atonement, biblical atonement means to cover an offense or to reconcile. So it means to cover or to reconcile. It occurs when one party commits a transgression and the other chooses to cover or pardon it and restore it. So normally, and this is what's important, normally it is the person who commits an offense who must make amends or restitution through some act of penance. So in other words, if you did it, you got to fix it. It's your responsibility. But not in the Bible. This is what separates Christianity from all the other religions of the world. God did something for us, as us, so that we could get the reward because of His love for us. All the other religions of the world, they're consistently day-to-day working, trying to earn some special place with God. But because of what Jesus did through this one act, it changed history forever. He graciously purged away our sins and reconciled us to Him without the punishment. But there's another form of atonement that we want to end with this morning that I want to point out, and this is really the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of the gospel and the central message of the Bible, and this is called penal substitutionary atonement. And you will see this all through the Bible. Penal means relating to or involving punishment, penalties, or liable to be punished. Substitution means a person or thing acting in the place of another. So we see this word penal in what is our modern day, what do we call them, known as penitentiaries. It's a place of punishment for what? A crime. So we get our biblical, our English word penitentiary from the Bible, from what happens as a result of somebody committing a crime. So therefore, penal substitutionary substitution occurs when one person takes the punishment for the offense of another. You committed the crime. You deserve the penalty, but somebody else pays it for you. All instances, and this is key, all instances of atonement in the Bible feature four elements. Every single one of them. They feature four elements, a transgressor, God's judgment, a replacement, and a blood covering. And a blood covering. And let me show you why this is important, and you can see this through the Bible, and I'll just do it real quickly. We see the first trace of penal substitution as early as Genesis 3. After Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate the forbidden fruit, they became aware of their nakedness. The Bible says, consequently, the Bible tells us that they hid from God's presence in shame. But God graciously clothed Adam and Eve with garments of skin, Instead of killing Adam and Eve as they deserved, because that is the penalty for treason, Adam and Eve committed treason. God gave them authority over the earth. He said, take dominion, have authority over everything. God even gave them, allowed them the ability to name what he created. They had all authority. They turned around and gave the authority over to the devil. They committed treason, and the punishment for treason is death. But God didn't kill them. God killed an innocent animal as a substitution and used it to cover them, which is the first biblical reference to atonement that God set in place that began a system from that point on. This event introduced the sacrificial system required to cover the transgression of human sin. So according to the Bible, when someone sins, it demanded blood sacrifice for sin. Now I got to asking the question, and you may too, why so much blood? You know, what's the deal? Why, why is it blood everywhere? I mean, you read the Old Testament and you think about when they went through all these sacrifices and stuff, there's blood everywhere. Because it had to cover. So God couldn't see them. And their sin. And here's the point. 
Life is in the blood. It's not in your, not in your skin, not in your flesh. Life is in the blood. Life represents, blood represents life. So in an animal, the penalty for our sin is life for life. So it's not just flesh. It's like, okay, well, cut their foot off. No, that won't do it. They've got to die, but the only way they die is by their blood, by getting the blood out of the body so that they die. So Jesus had to do the same. As a sacrifice, the Bible says, is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He was a lamb without spot or blemish that sacrificed himself and letting his blood come out. We see this same thing in the Passover. When the lamb was sacrificed, blood was put over the doorposts so that the death angel would come over when we see atonement there. But here's what's interesting. Did you notice where God told him, put it on the lintel, on the doorpost, but don't put it on the threshold? Why? Because Hebrews says, you will not put the blood of Jesus Christ or trample it under the foot of man. No, because the blood represented who Jesus Christ was, and you're not going to walk on Jesus. You're not going to walk on the very life of of the Son of God. So they couldn't put it on the threshold, only on the doorposts and over the, on the sides as a representative of what Jesus was going to do. So it introduced Hebrews 9.22. It says, Instead, he said, Under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Another translation says remission of sin. Anybody recognize that word? Remission. Some people in here may have even had cancer, went into remission. Did you know there's multiple kinds of remission? I don't have time to get into it, but it's interesting when you study blood. You know, I never did study it because in science, I don't even think I was in class even though I was there. Um, But you study it, there's different kinds of of remission. There's actually what is called molecular remission. It's where they go in there and look at it under a microscope. You can have remission, but then there's molecular remission that they go in under a microscope look at every single cell. They find one cell. Then there's a possibility of return. So what do they do? Is they replace your blood and your bone marrow, which produces blood, with someone else's. And they call that, do anybody know what that's called? What? Bone marrow transplant. What happens is you literally get replaced with a new identity. Jesus came and replaced our old identity with His new identity. He did not just remission of our sins. He went clear to molecular remission of our sins into our spirit and changed our identity. The Bible says because of the blood of Jesus, we become like Him. Two have become one. The Bible says, the Apostle Paul said, that his spirit and our spirit are one. We are one and the same, which is very interesting. We see this system all through the Bible. Um, in the book of Leviticus, how many of you have ever read the book of Leviticus? Since Pinkowski, my friend Scott Pinkowski is not here when I first met him, he said, yeah, I was reading that book, uh, Lectivus, he goes, no, I don't get it. You know, so it's not Lectivus, it's Leviticus, but it's interesting if you get a chance to read it because it covers a lot of this. In Leviticus 16, we see the annual day of atonement. On that day, the high priest took a goat, killed it, sprinkled its blood over the mercy seat, and in the front of the mercy seat, Leviticus 16, 15, it says, by doing so, the high priest made atonement for the holy place. Because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgression, all of their sins. The goat served as a substitute and its blood as a covering. So let's look at Leviticus 17 real quick. We already read verse 11, but I want to read verse 14 because it continues this thought about life is in the blood. Listen to what he said. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. 
For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. In the New Living Translation, I love this, it says, And for the life of the body is in the blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you, making you right with the Lord. It is the blood given in exchange for a life that makes purification possible. You're purified because of what Jesus has done. Now, why is this crucifixion of Jesus and the blood of Jesus so important? And why is your life in His blood? Because, listen, if you and I, and this is so important to leave as a thought for you, we do not have a real appreciation for what Jesus did in sacrificing Himself and shedding His blood. Why do we not? The reason we don't is because we didn't grow up in the system. We didn't grow up generation after generation after generation dealing with sacrificing animals, sacrificing day in and day out, hauling our animals wherever we lived to the nearest temple where a priest was able to be given that. They stood in your place, got all their garb on, did all their stuff, made sure they went into the Holy of Holies, sacrificed for you, came back out, and then you went on your way, but as soon as you did something else, you had to do it again. So it was constant, day in and day out. Blood, blood, sacrifice, killing of an animal, blood, blood. It was the only thing that would do it. Jesus comes and ends the system. He ended the system. For one thing, He killed the prophet people. He destroyed incomes. People were making generational living out of that religious system. He killed it. He came in and said, this is over, it's done. So what did he do? He just ended generations of people's money. People lived on when he did this. He, he wiped it out. It was part of their culture. You and I, this is not part of our culture. People living in our country today have the benefit of what Jesus Christ has done and don't even realize it. They get the benefit of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross without, the, without understanding the cost. <clears throat> Jesus became this animal over and over and over again. Animal sacrifices of the Old Testament were temporary and a foreshadow of a greater atonement of the death of Jesus. It was the ultimate and all-sufficient atonement and it bore the elements of all four <clears throat> of the penal requirements. According to the Bible, we all know it, humans are the transgressors because we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God's justice and wrath requirement for our sins, and the sentence is death. But because of His mercy, God covered our sin and sent His Holy Son to serve as a substitute and take the punishment Consequently, the blood that Jesus shed on the cross atoned for the sins of the world. And this is a great thing to remember. Mercy, the mercy of God is when you and I don't get what we deserve. And the grace of God is when you and I get what we don't deserve. It switches. God gives us something we don't deserve. And mercy says, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. Ephesians 1, seven it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Now let me end with this thought. We started with this, and we're ending with this. Only people who believe in the name of Jesus and confess Him as Lord and Savior will receive forgiveness and reconciliation with God. John 3.36 and Romans 10.9 tells us that. Everyone else who is not born again has no benefit from the blood of Jesus and what they are doing. What they are doing because they will not receive Jesus Christ as their sacrifice. What they are doing is they are trampling under their feet the blood of Jesus and treating the blood of Jesus and His sacrifice as nothing and as a common thing. And as a result, 
Hebrews tells us that these people will receive a severe punishment for what they're doing. So you and I this morning that are in this place and have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior and believe in what Jesus' blood represents, you are the smartest people on the face of the earth because you have enough good sense to know I'm not going there. I'm not going to be guilty of rejecting the blood of Jesus and trampling it underfoot and acting like it doesn't matter. So what's scary is for people out there that you know that have never accepted Jesus Christ, they are facing, they are facing a day of severe punishment. And it isn't because God wants it. It's because there's two requirements. The penal system that God implemented is here, or what Jesus did for you. you got to pick which one you're going to live under. So if you pick this one, where Jesus didn't fulfill it for you, you'll do it for yourself. We all have to pay for our own sins unless we come to Jesus for Him to pay for us. Thank God. Look at your neighbor and say, aren't I a smart person? Amen. Well, Father, we thank You today for what Jesus Christ has done. Help us to understand the blood of Jesus, what is so important about it in our lives, what You have given to us as a result of it. I thank You, Lord, for Your promises, what the blood brings into our life. And what Jesus did as a substitution for us, that He gave us His life in place of ours. Because blood, in the blood of Jesus, is our life. And we thank You for this today, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Well, God bless you. Don't forget, um, meeting coming up, ladies, hang out in here. And also, don't miss next week, because we're going to talk about this term that we might have all heard, pleading the blood of Jesus. Is that in the Bible? We're going to take a look at that and find out what that means in connection with the blood of Jesus. So don't miss it. Come on back.